I think we'll wait just a minute. I do not see either Adria or Chris yet, unless I'm not seeing things. I think Chris may be on. I see. I see a C. Oh. Well. Chris, is that you? I thought that C was Debbie. No, there's 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 a Chris on the screen. Uh, I'm a case. I'm KCM. Okay. There is a Chris, but he's muted, so that may be why we're not hearing him. Yeah, I think that's probably our Chris. And let's see. Was Adria going to be on? Laura, had she said anything to you? Yes, she plans to be on. I think you're you're right in just giving a few minutes. Yes, Chris is on. Sorry, I was muted. The my internet decided to disappear again to require a complete reload. Welcome. Don't you just love computers? I mean, you know, it just disappears you. I see Diane. Good morning. Ms. Diane, how are you, dear? I'm fine. How are you? I'm pretty good. I see Assad. Good morning. Yeah. While we're waiting, as Laura suggested, I'll welcome two people to our ranks, our new engineer, Don, and intern, Meredith. We're welcome. We're glad to have you on board with us. Thanks for being part of the team. <laughs> John, I just wanted to acknowledge that all of our board members are now online. Okay. So with that, let me just read the disclaimer and then I'll ask if Jay would read the motion to have an electronic meeting. But chapter 1283 of the Virginia Acts of the Assembly addresses the ability of districts to hold electronic meetings without the need for a quorum being present in a single location when a state of emergency has been declared pursuant to sections 44-146.17 of the Code of Virginia. Jay, would you make the motion please? Yes, I move that the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District Board of Directors has determined that the nature of the declared COVID-19 virus emergency makes it impractical or unsafe for us to assemble in a single location for the purpose of transacting business statutorily required or necessary for us to continue operations and discharge our lawful purposes, business, and responsibilities. I ask for a second. Is there a second? I'll second. Um, Monica has seconded. I'll just call the roll, and if you agree with the motion, please signify by saying aye. If you disagree, say nay. Uh, Peters? Aye. Corner? You're mute, you're muted, Chris. He, he might say, hey, uh, well, not muted. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can. I, aye. Bilger? Aye, and I think that was Adria that seconded it. Bordis? It was. Aye. Okay. It was Adria. Yes. So we get the minutes right. Thanks for clarifying. Okay. Thank you, Monica. We now are ready, uh, Adria, for the election of officers. I think this is our first meeting of the of the new year. You have been the chair of the nominating committee. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, well, since we have been together for just a just barely a year. Um, I, I actually had an open discussion, as you know, with the board um, and and we um, all agreed that we would remain in our current roles. So um, I nominate uh, John Peterson for chair, uh, Jerry Peters for vice chair, Monica Bil Bilger for secretary and Chris Kerner for treasurer. I'll make Is that there a second. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded that we retain the same offices we had. Is there any further discussion? Once again, I'll just call the roll. If you are in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. If you're opposed to it, say nay. Uh, Director Peters. Aye. Director Bordas. Aye. Director Bilger. Aye. Director Corner. Aye. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. And I guess we will have the same officers. Congratulations, everybody. It's fun to work with you. Uh, Congratulations, everyone. Now, Chairman Peterson, can I just say one thing? You you certainly may. 
Um, just to my fellow board members, we have learned a lot in the last year. Um, this whole thing, COVID and quarantine, and we're going to learn a lot more doing our strategic planning. And I really look forward to working with all of you and my experience on the board. Um, I took my oath of office at the courthouse on December 28th um, to spend four more years serving this board. This is my 20th year serving the board. Um, I enjoy working with the staff and with all the volunteers, all of the partners, and especially all of you board of directors. So thank you very much for all of your support and for your confidence in me to work with you for the next four years. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. And just for the record, I think we're very fortunate in our district in not only having Adria, but her participation on such a regular basis. Many of the districts throughout the Commonwealth while they all have an extension director, don't quite have the same representation we do with Adria, so we're very fortunate. Uh, with that, uh, Mo Monica, it's time for the minutes, I think, of our November board meeting. Yes, and as far as I can remember that far back, I reviewed the uh, minutes and I would like to make a motion to approve them. Is there a second? I'll second. Been moved and seconded, the minutes be approved as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carried. All right. How about the treasurer's report, Chris? Again, it's November and December, I think. Second right. quarter. I've reviewed the treasurer's reports for November and December 2020, find them acceptable, and recommend that they be filed for audit. They will be filed for audit. The treasurer's report has been ex uh, received and will be filed for audit. So we are now down to executive operations committee meeting report and some recommendations. Laura, I think you have that. And I'm hoping that the board members, since we had that good executive committee meeting last week, I'm hoping one of the board members will step forward and make the, make the motion to approve some of these motions. So thank you. Um, we had a really great discussion uh, just this past uh, Thursday on a number of different items that have, uh, that um, we will be working toward in, in addressing over the coming uh, six months, as well as um, some of the, beginning some of the work on from the board perspective on the strategic plan and doing some of the SWOT analysis. Um, you do have the executive operations uh, committee report um, in your board package, and I just wanted to acknowledge a couple of items. Um, we will be undergoing a, a pretty comprehensive review of our personnel policies uh, over the next six months and some key items in particular um, as it relates to authorities, um, hiring, uh, uh, conduct, as well as um, reviewing our our position descriptions and a number of other things. Um, there is a copy of the uh, report that is and the outline for the activities that are going to be occurring over the next six months in the report as well. So we have the recommended action that came out of the committee would be to appoint um, Monica Bilger and myself to review our personnel policies uh, per the outline that was presented. Um, and that we recognize that any recommendations and updates will be provided at our monthly executive operations committee meetings, and that we anticipate adoption of those new policies on June 22nd, 2021, um, so that we can begin to implement them in the next fiscal year. So that's that's the recommended motion. If, John, do you want to go motion by motion here? Yes, let's do. And so we have uh, a recommended action. Will somebody... If somebody is willing, will they make the motion that we approve that action? One of the board members? I would uh, make a motion to approve that, but I... Who was who that? Was that Monica? Yes, that's Monica. Okay, as we we'll appoint herself and, and Laura Grape to provide a review of our personnel policies for the outline presented in the report. And the recommendations and updates should be provided at monthly executive operations committee meetings and that an anticipated adoption date of june 22, 2021 be provided and implementation of new policies is expected to begin on july 1st is that the motion that's correct is there a second i'll second 
It's been moved by Monica, seconded by Adria. That is there any further discussion? Jerry, I think you're trying to say something. Um, I am going, if you, uh, I can't hear Jerry, I'm going on. to say something. Yeah, let, let me see. Let me finish just a minute. Uh, during, during our meeting, we discussed at length whether we needed to make these open meetings, the various work, work group meetings. Um, and I argued for, for not at, having to go through the 12, but I'm going to argue now. Yeah, uh, I would like to <laughs> those work meetings advertised so that uh, if, if more than two directors wish to participate, for, we're, we can do that. I'm sorry, Jerry. I think what I, I heard you saying, we are having a little bit of feedback. If you're not speaking, will you please mute yourself? No, did you all hear what Terry said? Do I need to repeat? No. Only part of it. I, I, I think Laura intended to advertise the work group meetings for the policy as well as the other uh, matters we're going to be talking about. Um, and and I, I suggested she maybe didn't need to do that as long as no more than two board members uh, participated in those meetings. Um, but I'm going to retract that suggestion. Uh, I think they should be open so that if, uh, if directors, more than two directors wish to participate in the meetings, uh, we can do that without violating the Sorry. Laura, Any other comments? You would not be you would not be in violation of FOIA, but if you have more than two directors, then you must go in and out of those committee meetings the same way that you're doing the board meeting, where you're declaring that there's a state of emergency and that's the reason for having the meeting. So um, you just make sure that you go through the same process we go through for the board meeting in those committee meetings if you have three directors present or more. Yes, that's you, Debbie. that's understood. Thank you, Debbie. I think that's right. We all understand that. Any other discussion? And the meetings need to be advertised in advance. Is there any other discussion? Am I hearing from Debbie that they do need to be advertised in advance regardless? Or, what, or am I hearing that Jerry would like to have them advertised in advance? Thank you. Well, well, all committee meetings should be advertised in advance in advance they're part okay. of the board's work but if you only have two board members there then in theory uh, you're not in violation of the freedom of information act because you have less than three board members there right. once you have three board members it becomes a public meeting and is subject to foia so um in theory, all of your work should be open to the public, but what the FOIA guidance says is if you have three or more voting members, then it's a public meeting, so you need to make sure you're following the letter of the law if you're going to have three or more. Debbie, this is a work group. We would not have three or more voting members. We might have some other board members listening in, but the work group members themselves do not contain all those board members. Um, I'll, I'll yield to Laura, who's your FOIA member, but I think you could get caught on a technicality on that. I would feel the same way. I would rather be safe than sorry in that regard. And I thought we so, agreed to advertise all of these meetings yeah. anyway. There was no, there was no agreement to not advertise. Hey, can I ask a favor? Jonna Gagnon, can you please mute your microphone? I think we might be getting I'm some trying to, it you. won't mute. I am trying, it won't mute. Oh, maybe there's a way the host can mute you. And host can mute it, great, but I can't. Cool. All right. Because I recognize that and I've been trying and I've actually disconnected my audio a couple times. And uh, that's the only way I can mute. Is by just Technology is wonderful when it works. <laughs> How did you even know, Adria, that it was Jonna's? Uh, Tell you what, I'm going I'm to log out and try coming back in, see if that works for you. Okay. Anyway, we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion to establish this work group? If not, let me go around the horn and, and ask for yeas and nays. Uh, I'll start with Director Peters. If you're in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. If you're opposed, uh, signify by saying nay. Aye. Director Peters, aye. Director Bilger? Aye. Director Bordas? Aye. Director Corner? Aye. The work group is established.
Laura. Okay, we'll move on to the uh, next item. We, um, the Executive Operations Committee reviewed a um, policy, some policy changes um, that we would like to make some immediate uh, action on regarding the removal of sort of a defunct uh, policy that has not really been utilized uh, for, for quite some time regarding employee health benefits. Um, and to actually add a policy that would really incorporate language that uh, we approved actually back in June to better define what full-time and part-time mean in regards to our participation in our benefits program, as well as to acknowledge what some of the uh, qualifying events may be for um, changes to enrollment or, and eligibility for our participation in our benefits program as well. So um, the, the recommended policy is within the report. Um, I do wanna note just two changes uh, that were suggested um, and that were incorporated as a result of, of our, our time together, as well as um, a very eagle eye uh, a staff member, which I really appreciate as they were requesting just a little bit of additional clarification. Um, the following statement was added that the board of directors may authorize leniency to the 30 day requirement um, for uh, acknowledging any qualifying events. If the circumstance of the qualifying event makes it difficult for an employee to communicate their needs for change in coverage. And this I think represents again, the supportive nature of our board. And I really appreciate the suggestion in, in bringing this forward and recognizing that there are some events that are just really difficult and that we need to uh, demonstrate some some sympathy and compassion for. Um, one other note that I wanted to mention in terms of a, of a change um, is just to acknowledge, which is this is tacit policy right now, that um, if a spouse has a change in job uh, status, they may retire or their job changes, um, that that is also deemed a qualifying event as well. So there's just some clarification that was added to the policy just to acknowledge those two events um, as also being uh, reasonable qualifying events, which could uh, institute a change in enrollment. Um, so with that, um, we the, there are two recommended motions to be made. One motion is to immediately remove the defunct policy on employee health benefits without retroactive payments. Um, so, John, I don't know if you want to move forward with. We will do them. We, we will. We'll take them uh, in order. We'll first ask for a motion to remove the defunct policy, and then we'll ask for another motion after we've dealt with the first one to add the new policy. Is one of the directors willing to offer a motion to immediately remove the defunct policy? I'll make that motion. Board, board member? I'll second it. Who, who motioned? Adria? Yes. It was Adria and then Mr. Corner. And Chris, is there any further yes. discussion? Hearing none, I'll go around the horn once more. Director Peters, if you're in favor, signify by saying aye. If not, signify by saying nay, please. Director Peters. Aye. Director Bilger. Aye. Director Bordas. Aye. Director Corner. Aye. The motion to remove the defunct policy has passed. Now we will take up the motion to add the new policy regarding our commitment to offer participation to benefits package. Uh, is there a director who will make that motion? I will. This is uh, Monica. Director Bilger made the motion. Is there a second? second? Any further discussion? I think it was Chris that seconded, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any further discussion? Hearing none, once again, we'll Call the roll, Director Peters. If you're in favor, signify by saying aye. If you're opposed, say nay. Director aye. Peters. Aye. Director Corner. Aye. Director Bordas. Aye. Director Bilger. Aye. The motion's passed. Both motions passed. Great. Oh, we are now down, I think, to the benefits policy changes, Laura. Uh, well, we are actually, I apologize, John, because they are a little bit out of order. We just reviewed the benefit policy changes. We're actually going up to the, the governance and board operating procedures. There you go. Right. Yep. <laughs> so I apologize that they're slightly out of order. Right. <laughs> Excuse me. I've got a little tickle in my throat. <clears throat> um, again, I wanted to thank the, the board. This is um, the idea of developing some governance and board operating procedures has come up um, at um um, in the past among the board and uh, appreciate the, the interest and the willingness to move forward on developing 
some of these. And again, it, it helps to document the culture of, of our organization, just as the personnel policies help to capture things on the staff side as well. Um, there is a proposed outline that has been developed in an approach to review, update, and document our governance and, and board operating procedures. Um, and I want to express some appreciation to uh, our board members, both Chris and Adria, for their willingness to step up and um, support this initiative, as well as associate directors Diane Hoffman and Elaine Tolan, who have also um, um, uh, stepped up to um, support this initiative as well. Um, the outcomes of this uh, effort over the next six months will really result in developing some recommendations for the board to review and approve um, that not only help to develop those procedures, but also look at supplementing our orientation program um, to provide some developmental training as well for any new board member that comes on again and, and helping to su support our culture as well as biannual evaluation procedures so that we can have check-ins from time to time um, and just do a you know understand how we're doing and if there are any additional needs it helps to set some um, opportunities for further clarifications and addressing any needs into the future. So with that, um, the recommended motion is to authorize Adria Bordas, Laura Grape, Diane Hoffman, Chris Corner, and Elaine Tolan to develop board governance and operating procedures, develop draft, excuse me, recommended board governance and operating procedures per the outline that is presented and that those recommendations will be presented at monthly executive executive operations committee meetings with anticipated approval by the district board of directors on June 22nd, 2021. Thank you, Laura. Would one of the directors move we adopt that recommended action? I would move to adopt that. Re recommended by Director Peters. Is there a second? I'll second. And was that Monica? Yes. Then moved and seconded that we adopt the recommended action. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, once again, I'll call the roll. If you're in favor of the action, signify by saying aye. If you're opposed, say nay. Director Peters? Aye. Director Bilger? Aye. Director Bordas? Aye. Director Corner? Aye. The motion passed. Once again, thank you, everybody, and Laura? Great. Well, thank you very much. And again, I think all of these initiatives, while it's going to be a very busy next six months, um, are really going to have some wonderful impact for the organization um, well into the future. So uh, really appreciate the time and the commitment that everybody is is dedicating to um, documenting these processes and our policies. Um, yeah. The last item I just wanted to mention is that we did um, talk, discuss and review the strategic planning uh, development process um, as was discussed back in November. Um, we will be moving forward with uh, um, making modifications and updates to our um, strategic plan, reaching out to partner organizations and providing some sort of facilitated approach to the best that we can for DCR requirements. Um, however, I think we've, we've uh, really started uh, with the board at this past meeting and conducting a bit of a, a SWOT analysis, strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. and. Um, I, I will just say in the response to, you know, uh, that conversation, we certainly have some really uh, considerate and thoughtful folks um, sitting around our tables. So uh, I just really appreciate everybody's participation in that process. So we will continue to move forward and, and bring updates um, appropriately. Laura, this is Jerry. Yes. Uh, I was looking for the um, SWAT analysis we documented during our meeting uh we're going to send it out to us have you sent i'm going to send i'm sorry jerry Is it i have not sent that out yet i will i will send it to you uh here this week i apologize i ran out of time last week i, I understand i i was afraid i missed it so nope nope it hasn't reached you yet but thank you thank you thank you laura and i think uh we really are appreciative of diane and elaine for helping out with some of the things we we need to do I think, uh, Adria, we're down to the TRC summary and recommendations. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, technical Review Committee met um, last week on Tuesday, and I really appreciate everyone who took the time to, to join us. Um, we went through some reimbursements as uh, some of the applications are still in process for 
this year. Um, so we didn't have any new applications to review. We were just kind of reviewing reimbursements. So Dan Schwartz provided an overview, overview and before and after pictures of two completed VCAP projects and noted that because the property owners used to use used plugs instead of container plants, a lot of the project was costing less um, with the overall size. And that was a good thing for the project and the property owners. Um, that was project 21-2020-016. And, and Dan also noted that um, in an additional project, um, which uh, was uh, 21-2020-012, converted an a entire front yard, which was turf and slopes toward the home, to really a beautiful, dense conservation landscaping. And I, I really appreciated some of those before and after uh, photos. So um, there are two projects uh, as far as um, uh, the uh, ultimate uh, recommendation. Um, I'm going to make a motion to approve the reimbursement of VCAP projects 20, excuse me, 21 2020 012 and 21 2020 Is there a second to that motion? I would second that and I want to commit. Uh, commend Dan on the graphics for some of his projects and show. They're very entertaining and informative. It's been moved and seconded. We approve the two projects. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, once again, we'll call the roll. If you're in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Opposed, say nay. Director Peters. Aye. Director Bordas. Aye. Director Bilger. Aye. Director Corner. Uh oh. Aye. The ayes have it. The motion is carried. Thank you, Adria. Anything else? Yep. We have uh, we have some EIP funded um, conservation assistance program. These are county uh, funded programs that are going to reimburse uh, HOAs or places of worship. Uh, so Dan presented an overview of the following three projects. Um, we had um, we had a project with St. Peter's in the Woods, okay, and and that was more of an energy project. Um, they uh, that was, um, if I recall, uh, dishwashers and a refrigerator um, to make them more modern and energy star appliances. Um, and then the Reston Association and Concord Village took advantage of some funding to um, to get some conservation landscaping completed. Uh, what was what was really um, nice also in this in this part of the meeting is that Dan at least showed us some of the video that will be used in the Eco Savvy Symposium um, from our from our intern Meredith Keppel, who was our outreach intern this past fall. So that was a, a, a nice treat, and I re really appreciate that, Dan. And hopefully, um, we'll get the sound worked in there too. Um, there is some committee. There is some recognized need for further discussion and uh, and policy. Um, um, changes here um, and that we also discussed references for inspection and maintenance of project and planting with seed mixes uh, and that was in reference to a project with Reston Association. Um, so you know there these are discussions that were wonderful and very fruitful within the uh, within the TRC. Um, I'm going to make a motion to approve the reimbursement request for St. Peter's in the Woods Energy Project, the Reston Association, and Concord Village conservation landscaping projects. So we have a motion to approve those three projects. Is there a second? I have a second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? John, I just wanted to make a quick note that for the St. Peter's in the Woods project, um, not only did they do some appliance enhancements, they also made improvements to uh, lighting as well as some weathering, uh, weather stripping and things like that throughout the uh, facility to improve uh, insulation. So I just wanted to to note that there were were several parts to that project for a really very reasonable cost. Thanks for reminding right, me. That's, Sorry. That's right. We discussed that. It's been moved that we approve the three projects. Moved and seconded. Hearing no further discussion. Once again, I'll go around to each director. Uh, if you're in favor, say aye. If you're uh, not in favor, say nay. Director Peters. Aye. Director Bordas. 
Aye. Director Corner. Aye. Director uh, Bilger. Aye. The motion is carried. Adria. Okay, so there was just some further discussion within the meeting that I think was um, worth mentioning. Uh, Willie Wood shared potential agriculture call share cooperators will that we we thought might be working with uh, or on hold due to financial considerations because of the pandemic. And in addition, one of our cooperators recently got rid of their animals and converted their focus more towards vegetable production. And he intends to share more of that uh, in an update in February. So I look forward to that, Willie. And then um, we had some discussion from Charles Smith with the Long Branch uh, Central Watershed Management Area Planning. Uh, we also discussed native seed mi mixes for erosion and uh, sediment control. Um, and then also um, discussed what I think Laura is going to talk about next, which is the Water Quality Improvement Program partnership with Land Development Services. I think you have that on the agenda, right, Laura? Okay. Um, and then there were some other discussions about the project at the Great Falls Grange with uh, uh, Jerry Peters and Maria Harwood um, and uh, and further discussion about the Urban Ag Work Group and the Fairfax Food Council in response to the call for grants by um, NACD and we're going to be discussing that in just a little bit. Um, this gives an opportunity for um, for food production and distribution um, and providing some pass-through grants that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, the proposal is due February 15th and we talked about um, discussing it at this meeting. So that's all I have, Chairman Peterson. Thank you, Adria. That TRC, which I think has only been uh, in existence, what, about two years now for us, has really been a big help. We appreciate it. Oh, well, I really appreciate you. Thank you. Um, I think we're down to approving some uh, COVID policies and procedures. Laura, do you want to just take the lead in discussing that? Yes. Um, so, and, and I, John, I just sent you a quick note and I wanted to acknowledge two quick things, if you don't mind, just prior to jumping into the COVID policies. Um, one, I wanted to welcome, if, if that's okay, John. Yes, that's fine. Did you send it on the chat? I no, I sent it to you to be a text message, um, oh, but I'll, okay. I'll share with others what I just sent you. I wanted to welcome, um, well, let's see, I think she might have just dropped off here, but Peggy McBee Shaw, um, the di new district conservationist with NRCS based out of Warrington, was just on the call a few moments ago. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that she was was with us. Also, um, and, I'm, and I hope we'll have the opportunity to get to this, uh, John, as well. Um, we do have Ashley Palmer, our, our conservation education specialist, right. who's right. ready and prepared to share um, a, a lot of the efforts that we did this past year on outreach and education. So I just don't want to lose sight of that. I know that's up at the top and not necessarily nestled right into our agenda. So just wanted to, to make a note on that. Um, I hope will be on when it's uh, time for partners again. If not, um, I know that we did receive a report from her and it was distributed, right. but um, I, I hope that she's on as well. But I just wanted to acknowledge that that she was with us. Um, in the board packet, you did receive a copy of our COVID-19 response policies. We have been really using these policies since March. Um, and. Uh, it was just this was an opportunity to write them down and codify them and incorporate them as part of our um, as part of our policy document. This is in response to the COVID-19 emergency temporary standards and requirement, which were pushed forward and um, help us to reach compliance with them um, so that we are acknowledging the measures and the practices that we put in place to ensure that we have a safe workplace as well as that we're caring for our, um, our, our employees and everybody who is associated with our, our organization. So um, the recommendation, there's a, there's a couple of things. Again, these are our tacit policies. They are things that are required um, as part of meeting that uh, as to be com in compliance with the temporary standard. Um, and it helps us again to just demonstrate what it is that we are doing. In particular, the one thing that I do want to mention to you um, that's a little different, perhaps, 
Is the re recommendation for uh, continuing the expanded FMLA and the emergency paid sick leave policy for the coronavirus. This is also referred to as the Family First uh, Coronavirus Response Act. That was the federal act that uh, established this program. That federal program sunsetted on December 31st, 2020. The recommendation is that we voluntarily accept and, and continue that program, which would allow for us to be able to uh, provide expanded FMLA, um, the Family Medical Leave Act, in certain cases where um, it makes it difficult to uh, uh, receive child care, um, but also that we expand the emergency sick paid, paid sick leave, excuse me, let me get my tongue in order here, um, expand the emergency paid sick leave in situations where an employee or one of their immediate family members um, has suspect is suspected of having uh, coronavirus. This would essentially mean that they would not be required to um, use their their uh, accrued sick leave, um, but that the district would pay essentially for their uh, for two weeks of their time. Um, to be able to be, if they're in, required to be in quarantine. Um, the recommendation for this policy is that we expand it through the 31st of, of this current calendar year. Um, in large response, because we are still, I, I know we have a few folks that have been vaccinated, John, uh, you know, our family members, congratulations, Jerry and Harry. We're all hoping that we get there too. But because we are still in a vulnerable state, um, I think it would be prudent to continue offering this kind of service. The only difference is, is that we would not be able to request a federal reimbursement for the for that time. So this would be um, funds that would come out of the district, uh, come out of district funding. Um, other than that, this is again very consistent. We did approve the the fam, um, family first coronavirus response act back in May. And again, the request is that we continue this into this, this current uh, uh, calendar year, and it would be a temporary uh, policy until um, December 31st or until the board decides that it would like to uh, um, end this policy as well. But I'm happy to answer any questions. I know that this is a, a lengthy document. I really appreciate um, the time and the commitment from Heather Shackley, Maria Harwood, and Ashley Palmer, who all supported the development of these policies and the review of these policies. Um, it's always very insightful and uh, helpful to get uh, staff perspective on this because they are the ones that are rolling things out and having to ensure that they are doing things um, themselves. And so de the development of template language um, and good practices was also, they, they provided vital input into, into that. Thank you, Laura. Does anybody on the call, not just board members, have any comments or questions they'd like to ask about the uh, COVID policies? If not, would one of the directors make the motion to approve that uh, that recommended action? I'll do that. It was Chris. That was Chris who made the motion. Is there a second? I'll second. And seconded by Bordas. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll go around the same procedure. I'll start with Director Corner. Aye. Director Bordas. Aye. Director Bilger. Aye. Director Peters. I think he said aye. The motion is carried. Aye. Thank you, Jerry. The motion is carried. All right. We're now down, Laura, I think, to a resolution dealing with urban ag support with the Fairfax Food Council. Yes, so I, and I hope uh, Adrian and I can kind of piggyback on this a little bit, but um, we did uh, introduce this uh, briefly at the TRC meeting, as Adria was noting. Um, we have uh, worked on urban agriculture has been incorporated into our strategic plan for at least seven years now um, to begin to look at ways that our district can support the, the uh, urban agriculture from a wide variety of different perspectives. And as you all already know, Willie provides, um, is our certified planner. He provides soil and water quality conservation planning services 
to uh, equine operations and any traditional agricultural operations within Fairfax County, nutrient management planning and integrated pest management planning as well as part of those um, as part of his program. He also supports the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Ordinance initiatives um, to ensure that uh, a number of our agricultural lands, including those equine operators, are also meeting uh, the, the requirements and the needs and providing those recommendations, and if they are not, um, to support uh, I, the identification of water quality issues and uh, proposing solutions in order to resolve them. Um, we also work with the Department of Planning and Development um, in supporting when a new community garden goes into effect that we also provide and are available to be technical advisors and develop those conservation plans, which you all have reviewed as part of the technical review process and approved as, as um, members of the board as a whole. There's also the Fairfax Food Council's Urban Agriculture Working Group, which is a, a, a compendium of a number of different agencies and is really um, sponsored by the Fairfax County Health Department. Uh, it's chaired by uh, two members of our Fairfax County community. The Virginia Cooperative Extension is represented. The district is represented, as is public schools. It's really a great working group for the, the, um, the development of shared ideas and projects moving forward. Two years ago, we applied for funding through the NACD Urban Agriculture and Community Grants, um, which we unfortunately were unsuccessful in that particular one to, to support some of the initiatives of the Fairfax Food Council. But we're not giving up and we're going to try again. So the Fairfax Food Council's Urban Agriculture Work Group has the, uh, um, the, the goal of continuing to improve food security across Fairfax County. Over the last year, they've developed some mapping in order to identify where there may be gaps um, in the availability of, of not just community gardens and food plots um, that can be uh, adopted by individuals, but a little bit larger scale uh, production-based community gardens um, so that they can support distribution through a wide variety of different events, um, usually at a place of worship or through um, some of the public schools. So with that, um, there's been a small group of representatives that have been getting together to develop the proposal. The proposal is due to NACD on February 15th. And right now we've got a really good, um, I'm gonna say meaty skeleton because we still have some, some meat to put on the proposal itself, but we've at least got a really, really good outline. And with that, Adria, is it okay if I turn it over to you to perhaps read the resolution? We do need a resolution passed by our board of directors as part of the application process, which is good anyway. We always request board approval before applying for any funding um, as, as anyway, but this is a little bit more of a formal resolution. So Adria, well, I'll turn it over And the resolution is just, we authorize, we authorize ourselves to submit the proposal. That's right. Yeah, I'll turn it to Adria. Information. What, what I wanted to share also is that this would support, you know, gardening opportunities, community gardening opportunities for food production to help support um, areas that are truly in need of more, um, more secure food uh, sources. Um, this is also um, I've committed volunteers, master gardeners, myself to uh, be mentors, to be folks that would do site visits and help these these folks who are starting up the gardens or maybe need um, some uh, help or promote their sustainability within uh, the area. Um, we would also help to establish starter kits or even tools or recruit tool donations because I've learned that there's a lot of people out there who have a lot of a lot of tools and maybe they're not using them anymore and want to donate them. So uh, uh, Chairman Peterson, um, this is an official resolution to submit proposal to the National Association of Conservation Districts in support of the urban agriculture initiatives in Fairfax County. 
Whereas the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District has served the residents of Fairfax County directly and through partners to provide conservation information, technical services, education programs, and volunteer opportunities to residents on many aspects of water quality, non-point source pollution, and ec ecological health and connects residents with environmental initiatives and opportunities since its creation in 1945. And whereas the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District has a long history of responding to Fairfax County's changing rural to urban landscape, transitioning programs based on identifying needs, and whereas the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District is valued in the region for its leadership in using new and emerging techniques to to address both traditional issues and current challenges. And whereas the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District Board of Directors approved an objective to engage in emerging trends, issues, and resources, particularly related to stormwater best pra management practices on private property, urban agricultural and edible landscapes, invasive species, and energy conservation and efficiency as part of its current strategic plan. And whereas nearly 19.5% of the households in Fairfax County earn incomes below the cost of basic living expenses results in thousands of residents struggling to access healthful foods. And whereas the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District serves as a member of the Fairfax Food Council Urban Ag Work Group, which focuses on expanding gardens at schools, places of worship, and other community settings to help meet demands in cost-effective manner and to be a resource and support and promote new community gardens and improvement of existing gardens. And whereas the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District prepared a proposal to work in collaboration with a diverse membership of the Fairfax Food Council Urban Ag Work Group and created a grant program to establish infrastructure at community-centric facilities for production scale gardening, including places of worship, community center, apartments, etc., and food insecure areas identified by the Urban Ag Working Group. And whereas the proposal further supports grants to existing gardens to ensure their long-term sustainability and create mentorship programs to create a resource and network on topics such as community engagement, volunteer management, distribution event logistics, and youth and workforce development. And whereas the outcomes of this initiative will capitalize on Northern Virginia's Soil and Water Conservation District's knowledge and experiences to support the development of guidance materials and resources to support capacity building of the community, their pride and ownership over their gardens. Therefore, may it be resolved that the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District Board of Directors approves the submission of the Urban Ag Conservation Initiative proposal for con consideration by the National Association of Conservation Districts in their FY 2021 program year to develop urban agricultural strategies for Fairfax County that will guide future programs in an effective and efficient manner. That will be signed by you, Chairman Peterson. I take it, Director Bordas, yours is a motion that we approve that uh, we approve that proposal. I won't ask you to repeat it. Be it moved, yes. That is my motion. <laughs> is there is there a second to that motion? I'll second. I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded by Bilger. We'll go around once again and call the roll. Same rules. Director Corner. Director Peters. Aye. Director Bilger. Aye. Director Bordas. Aye. Thank you, Adria and Laura. That was a mouthful, Adria. Um, yeah, but I think it's very important for it us is. to know where our past is yes. and where we would like to be in the community. And I think it's important to be really good um, stewards of not only our land, exactly what we do, but also our communities that are going to be living off of that land. And, and that's what this grant will help do. And as I've told Laura, what you have forced me to do now is recuse myself from taking any action since I'm on the Urban and Community RPG for NACD, and we're the ones that sponsor those uh, uh, those applications. Well, maybe we can get but, but you to maybe good. we can get you to encourage some of your cohorts to um, yeah, look favorably there's ways on to do us. That. <laughs> there's ways to do that. All right, I think uh, Laura, we're now down to an authorization to accept some funds for um, water quality improvement program. Well, one more before oh, that. Wait a minute. No, we're supposed to work with the county and help help them uh, review some program authorities. So let's let's go to 
That's right. Item number seven. Um, and, and I just have to note, you know that it's a it's a, it's an exciting project when um, all the board members are trying to scramble to get to that second that the uh, be the second on that motion. <laughs> I always appreciate that. And uh, again, the, the support that's going to be a very exciting project if, if it's accepted by NACD. Well, I hope um, it will be. Uh, and so we we have um, a, a number of additional initiatives that have been underway. This is it should not be new. We have um, talked about this or brought this up briefly um, in in past meetings as well. And uh, I'm excited to say that this is is uh, moving forward. <clears throat> um, I, as you will see under item number seven and in the board package, there's a brief background statement on a proposed project in partnership with uh, Fairfax County's Land Development Services um, to review uh, their implementation of the Virginia Stormwater Management Program and the Virginia Erosion Sediment Control Programs authorities and uh, use a case study at the Inova HealthPlex, which had some challenges where there were uh, some significant um, challenges back in 2018 during construction, um, where there were some significant failures of some of the ENS uh, practices uh, that were installed there. Um, this was a, a project that was initiated by uh, Land Development Services and they approached the district because of our uh, independent and neutral role. Um, they are looking for information uh, in regards to what their current authorities are and to understand whether or not they are implementing their authorities to the full uh, to their full capabilities. And they're looking for any recommendations from us in regards to um, uh, whether or not they can can utilize other authorities or if they need to um, move forward with uh, trying to receive additional authorities from the state. Um, so. Land Development Services approached us with the interest in understanding that, um, and the scope of the initiative includes the review of the ENS control plan and the stormwater pollution prevention measures at the Inova HealthPlex in Fairfax, uh, uh, just outside of the city of Fairfax, right over off of Gallows Road near its intersection with um, 495. Um, we will conduct a constructive review of the current program processes and interview those that were involved in all aspects of the plan review, inspection, and enforcement of the ANOVA case. We will also be reaching out to members of the community um, and, uh, and representatives from ANOVA as well to be able to get their input and their feedback as well. It is intended to be retrospective. And we do hope that it's going to result in an impartial assessment of the whole situation. Um, we will be, uh, Don Lackamit, who started with this yesterday, is going to be the lead on this effort um, with his background and work uh, on, on plan review, along with um, his initiatives with the PFM and the understanding of a wide variety of these different practices and these different aspects of, of um, Fairfax County's program. He'll lend some great perspective and resources. He also knows a number of these folks, so he'll be able to provide that non-bias and um, uh, approach to uh, to this process, which is great. We have developed a scope of work um, that uh, goes into a little bit more detail in terms of some of those um, large uh, tasks associated with this project, and we do estimate a, a, the cost to be about $9,000, which Land Development Services has agreed to uh, cover. So we do anticipate about 120 hours of, of Don's time on this project um, over the course of the next few months. So with that, um, I am requesting authorization to submit that proposal and accept the funds. Is one of the board members willing to move that we accept that proposal? I, uh, John, this is Jerry. Yes. I, I have not seen the proposal. This is the first I've heard about it. How am I supposed to review something I know nothing about? We've heard about this. We've talked about it. Okay, I've missed that. Quite a bit, in fact. I, you know, I would have quite, if I were reviewing a proposal that my my company was sending out, uh, I'd want to ask questions. Whether it might be a great proposal, but you know, how are the rates uh, established, deliverables? And, and, and since I don't know, I can't I can't vote to approve it. I'll, I will. Explain. We haven't got a motion yet, so just I understand. Just, just so you know. Yeah. 
Is there uh, is there one of the board members that will move we approve that uh, uh, authorization to submit that proposal? I'll move so that we can discuss this. It's been moved that we uh, provide the authorization to submit the proposal for that authority's review. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Now, is there any further discussion? Jerry? I've already, I've already offered my he's, opinion. He's, he, he's given his comment. Is there any, are there any other comments? Hearing no other comments, we'll open it up for the vote and we'll do use the same rules. I'll start with uh, Director Corner. Aye. Director Bordas. Aye. Director Bilger. Aye. Director Peters. Abstain. Motion is carried. All right, I think we're now down to where we need an authorization to accept some funds for pilot use of the water quality improvement program. Laura, you want to take the lead in discussing that? Sure. So um, again, this is we have to, uh, discussed this at the TRC. <clears throat> um, as you'll see, again, this was provided in the board package. Uh, the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District and the uh, Department of Land Development Services has also discussed the development of a water quality improvement program, which would allow LDS to allocate funds that are collected under the county's existing erosion and sediment control enforcement program towards the conservation assistance program, which we administer here at the district. Um, the district and the LDS recognize that the partnership opportunity um, in which LDS could allocate the funds received from the fines that are collected through the enforcement program. Are you on Who is that? <laughs> I don't know, but that scared me there for a moment. Let's see. We had somebody. I think we're I think we're muted again. Okay, it may have just been some feedback. So I apologize for stopping in the middle of my sentence, but I wanted to make sure I wasn't cutting in somebody else off. Let me let me start um, again with my sentence here. The district and LDS recognize that uh, the partnership opportunity exists where LDS could allocate funds that are received from fines collected under the enforcement program toward these water quality improvement uh, projects uh, implemented through CAP which further improve the environment and, um, and some impacted uh, communities in a meaningful way as well. Um, this is a uh, arrangement that has not been quite formalized yet. We are looking to potentially go into an MOU, um, but more immediately, there's an opportunity to pilot the implementation of the program um, we requested the $4,204.03 to cover the dip difference that was necessary for the district approved impervious surface removal project at the Springfield Station HOA. We reviewed and approved that project back on October 27th, and you all might recall that we were um, we had discussed and you all had authorized me to continue to work with some county agencies in order to identify opportunities for uh, covering that difference. Um, the project is currently under construction, and the project has been reviewed and approved by the LDS director uh, for use of these, uh, these funds. Um, however, since the project is located in the Springfield District, it's also undergoing a courtesy review by Supervisor Harity, and we want to make sure that the Board of Supervisors are also aware of um, these projects and, the, and that this program could exist. So pending the outcome of the pilot, we may move forward with a memorandum of understanding uh, to develop and, and present to the board um, here in the coming months, which would solidify the WQIP partnership and document those roles and responsibilities uh, of each of our parties so it can be successfully implemented. But today I am requesting authorization to accept the $4,204.03 um, for pilot use of the WQIP and um, move forward with um, the development of an MOU to enter into official partnership with LDS on this program. Is a board member willing to make the motion that we accept the use of those funds for that purpose? I think, uh, Jerry, you're, you're muted. I, I so moved. It's been moved by Director Peters. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been and seconded by Director Corner. Any further discussion? 
Hearing none, we'll use the same rules. We'll go around and ask for your eyes and, and nays. Director Peters. Aye. Director Corner. Aye. Director Bordas. Aye. Director Bilger. Aye. That authorization is approved. And Laura, to back up just once, would you be kind enough to work with Jerry and talk with him a little bit about that uh, county program authorities review that we're going to work on? Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, I have no, I have no questions about the, the, the yeah. worth of that project. That, that's, yeah. that's the point. Right. I, we understand. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, I think now we're down to Ashley to talk about our nomination for the Cooperator of the Year Award. Is Ashley still with us? Yes, I am. Laura, I just need to see, would you like me just to read that nomination? Please. Okay. All right, so our okay. nomination for the 2020 Diane Hoffman Cooperator of the Year Award is Sarah Holtz, an Oakton resident and a volunteer natural resource steward. It is the district's vision for engaged communities working together to protect and restore natural resources. These movements are so often led by passionate volunteers and environmental stewards like Sarah Holtz, who gives so much of her time and resources to protect stream health, promote native gardens, and mentor youth in her community. Sarah donates over a thousand hours of her time each year to organizations like Fairfax Relief, the Fairfax County Park Authority, and the Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District. Sarah's environmental volunteerism is both far-reaching and long-lasting. Sarah began her first storm drain labeling and education project in 2015, and within a single year had led the effort to label every storm drain in the Waples Mill Elementary School attendance area. This extensive undertaking included 684 storm drains, 239 volunteers, and the education of 4,631 households in Vienna. The no dumping message that Sarah has stamped on her community will educate her neighbors about the impact of non-point source pollution in difficult run for many years to come. Since that time, she has continued to lead storm drain labeling projects throughout Vienna and Oakton, including a volunteer Fairfax volunteer fest project in October of 2020. Even during a global pandemic, Sarah partnered with the district to ensure a safe and enjoyable volunteer experience for the nearly 20 volunteers that joined her in the most recent project. Sarah is not only vocal and passionate about her environmental volunteerism, but also inspires and encourages her community to take action and initiate change. Sarah participated in the Virginia, Virginia Conservation Assistance Program, VCAP, to design and implement a conservation landscaping project to address erosion concerns in her front yard with native plants. In 2019, Sarah and her project were proudly featured on the annual Sustainable Garden Tour. Her efforts to share her experience with others hasn't ended there, Sarah says she's been giving garden tours to youth and parents, giving them plants for my garden, and showing them how to compost. The Holtz residents featured not only Sarah's front yard conservation landscaping project, but also hosted several boy and girl scouts who had worked with the homeowner to accomplish conservation projects. They presented projects on reducing plastic pollution, establishing monarch butterfly habitat, and invasive plant removal. This is just one of the many ways that Sarah mentors and encourages scouts and students in her community and engages them in her environmental volunteerism. Those of the district who have had the honor of working with Sarah Holtz on a multitude of projects are constantly impressed by her drive and dedication. Sarah has ingrained herself in the work of Fairfax County environmental community and we are all the better for it. It is for these reasons and many more that the staff asked the board to make a motion recognizing Sarah Holtz with our 2020 Diane Hoffman Cooperator of the Year Award and invite her to a board of directors meeting this spring so that we may celebrate her achievements and express our appreciation. Thank you, Ashley. Would one of the board members recommend that we uh, award Sarah Holtz as our co recognize Sarah Holtz as our Cooperator of the Year? I'll do that, Mr. Chris. As Chris has made the motion, is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded by Jerry. Any further discussion? Once again, we'll go around and ask for the same rules. Director Corner. Aye. But can Director we get, does Diane get to vote too? <laughs> the board members will vote. <laughs> the the I think board is named for Diane. We're so grateful. Director I Bordas should give her a Aye. special vote. We'll give her. We'll give her a special vote. Director Bordas. Director Bilger. Aye. Director Por Aye. Peters. Aye. And Associate Director Hoffman. He's muted. 
Yeah, she's muted. I'm just, I'm just proud of you guys. That's <laughs> <laughs> no, that's very good nomination. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Excellent. All right. We're down now to, I think, an appointment of a representative of the community action team, Laura. Yes, in your package, there's a, a brief um, description of the of the request that came from the Office for Environmental and Energy Coordination, um, not just a request, but an invitation uh, for the, the district to provide a, um, an, a point of representative to their community advisory group for the development of their climate ad adaptation and resilience plan. Um, just to read the what, what was uh, provided in, in uh, Kambi Zagazi, who's the director of OEEC, his invitation. Uh, in early 2021, Fairfax County will embark on a community-wide planning process for the Climate Adaptation and Resilience Plan, also lovingly known as CARP. Uh, CARP is an invasive fish, but CARP and planning is going to be good, good for the county. Um, the CARP will help the county better understand and prepare for the threats that climate change pose to its residents, businesses, infrastructure, and local government operations. The community advisory group will review and provide input on key deliverables throughout the planning process, such as an assessment of climate risks and vulnerabilities and climate adaptation and resilience strategies. The group will meet up to four times between February uh, 2021 and June 2022. Um, there is more information that is available on uh, the website. Uh, as Kambi's notes, the input from the members of the community advisory group will be critical to the success of the CARP and that we are invited to designate one representative to participate on the community advisory group. John, I want to note that Chris Corner has volunteered um, and has expressed quite a bit of interest in stepping up and fulfilling this role, and I'd like to make the recommendation um, that we nominate him as our representative, unless there's anybody else. Thank you, Laura. Would one of the board members recommend we nominate Chris? So moved. It's been moved by Peters. Is there a second? I'll second. Monica? Oh, that was Adria. But that was Adria? Okay. <laughs> we'll we'll go around once again. Director Peters. Same motion. Same motion. Aye. Director uh, Bilger? Aye. Director Bordas? Aye. Director Corner. Aye. And thank you, Chris, for volunteering. We appreciate that very much. Yeah, I, I actually once helped a friend with that was on a White House commission from um, American Institute of Architects do some resiliency work from the storms down south and ended up being a practical voice in their their work and ended up being cited in as part of the document they put together. So I think it's an important thing that happens and, and may tie in with our stormwater work pretty well. Um, let, let me, Chris, let me offer an opinion. Uh, if, if for those of you who follow the JET, the joint environmental team between uh, the board of supervisors and the school board, uh, they totally woofed when it came, they were talking about energy policy. They totally woofed, well, they, they were talking about energy and environment. They totally woofed anything having to do with the landscape, uh, vegetation and, and whatnot. Uh, I think that's why we're invited to participate here is to, is to reflect that that's part of any energy strategy. And so I hope you carry that ball for us. I just, do, we, I just, do, we, do we know, Laura, when they're gonna have their first meeting? It's my understanding that they're gonna begin in February of 2021, so within this next month. I also just wanted to note that this is a, a great opportunity um, The the climate action and resilience, resiliency piece oftentimes refers uh, primarily to uh, natural resource um, concerns and the utilization of, of many of our natural resources in, as a resilience measure um, is also really important. Uh, Chris, certainly don't hesitate to call on me. I did a tremendous amount of resiliency planning when I was over at with the Northern Virginia Regional Commission, and I'm happy to share ideas and, you know, brainstorm new things. I, I, I think a lot of this could integrate into some of what we've talked about in the strategic planning too. So might open new opportunities. <clears throat> Very good. Anything else? If not, either Harry or Laura is going to talk about the green breakfast. Yes, I'll, I'll begin, if I may, uh, the green breakfast that we just had last green breakfast 
featured Jim McGlone and the discussion about forestry and things. And I wanted to make it a point that I did not make very well uh, in the introduction. I've learned much about forestry and trees uh, from Jim McGlone as I have ever known from anybody else. And that includes, as I recall, some college courses I might have taken uh, about uh, forestry. Uh, Jim is a, a pro of great uh, skill and uh, has taught me an awful lot about trees, uh, both in my position as the chairman of the Tree Commission and as a member of the Tree Stewards Program. So this by way of, oh, one, one other thing there, I, Jim holds a doctorate in uh, economics. I did not uh, have that fact in my head at the time. And he can easily argue the relative uh, similarity between economics as we normally understand it and uh, the economics of a forest. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather interesting conversation. So that was our, our uh, green breakfast last time. Uh, Laura, can you help me with what's com coming up? Sure. I also just wanted to mention we had one of the largest turnouts for our green breakfast um, this past this past green breakfast. We had 98 participants um, that called in. So that was that was pretty significant. Um, our next green breakfast at the date here um, is March, March 13th. And it's actually going to feature Shannon Curtis uh, with the uh, Fairfax County Department of Public Works and Environmental Services Stormwater Planning Division. And he's going to be giving us um, uh, an overview of their uh, very comprehensive monitoring program. And I actually see Shannon uh, is joining us this morning uh, as well. And, and maybe he may, I don't mean to put him on the spot, but just wanted to welcome him as well um, and uh, thank him for um, uh, being willing to share some of the great work of, of his branch um, in the stormwater planning division and uh, look forward to seeing him in March. So that again is on March 13th and these will continue to be held virtually um, into the future until we uh, until we're able to gather again in large groups. Lauren, this is Jerry. Can I ask, uh, was Jim's presentation recorded? Is there a way we can look it up? It was recorded and it is available right now on YouTube. We also posted it on Facebook. I'll send the link out uh, to everyone here momentarily. Thank you. I had to miss that one. And Jim did an excellent job. So he always does. Yeah. Anything else on the Green Breakfast, Laura or Harry? March 13th next. March 13th, and we'll find out from Chris what's going on there. All right. I think, Jerry, we're down to the Tree Commission. That's you. Okay, we had our, I'm going to call it a regular meeting, but it was, you know, any more of these meetings are not regular, <clears throat> but on 21st of January last week. Two things of note, I think. One is that the about a year and a half or two years ago, I and another member of the uh, Tree Commission started working on updating the uh, Tree Commission's charter. Uh, it currently is in the zoning part of the county regulations. And there was a proposal to move it uh, to the uh, tree conservation uh, chapter in the in our in our county regulations. Uh, that apparently the move is about to be done. <laughs> there have been a few wordsmithing changes that uh, our county lawyers have added to it, changed some of the language modestly. <clears throat> so, but that change in where it's situated is 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 underway. The changes that. Um, uh, members of the Tree Commission approved at least a year ago, still have not been uh, reviewed by the county attorney and, and whoever else needs a public review and whatnot. So that's still pending for God knows how long, but we're making some motion by moving where it is <laughs> to the uh, tree, tree conservation chapter. Uh, the, other, the other discussion had to do with the community of practice, <laughs> which whenever we become active, uh, should have a major role not only in implementing the tree action plan um, that was approved in 2019 or early 2020, uh, but also it's written into the natural landscaping um, amendment to the comprehensive plan. So 
Uh, there's a lot riding on the, that uh, community of practice. And I really look forward to it. We have a lot of good things coming out of it, a lot of visibility of what all the, the um, county agencies, as well as other you know, interested uh, tree, tree partners, um, will bring to bear. We're having a hard time with the logistics. Obviously, COVID is affecting that. Um, but uh, we're also having, between the tree action plan report and green initiative number five report on low cost and no cost um, tree planting, and our the annual uh, report to the board of supervisors that's in the um, in the code I talked about it uh, now in the zoning ordinance. Um, we we've written ourselves into three different annual reports, and we're going we're going to discuss how to how to condense those into hopefully one or some some something less onerous than three different annual reports. Um, I think those those are the two major things: the, the charter and the community practice. Thank you, thank you, Jerry. Any questions for Jerry on the trade commission? If not, I think we saw Assad, or I saw Assad here for the Engineering Standards Review Committee. Assad. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Um, ESRC met on January seven. And agenda, there were not any uh, any new item to consider, but there were some old business that were discussed. Some PFM plates and relevant texts were agreed to be deleted. I have given details of those plates and proposed texts in my November report. Uh, Mr. John Friedman gave a new presentation of proposed amendment to RPA registrations requirement as covered by PFM Chapter 12. This was the third draft. A copy was attached to my report that Heather has forwarded uh, for your review. I believe that this item is still open for comments and recommendations. I strongly re uh, recommend that the staff look at these amendments because they are directly related to a proposal they, they give to LDS when there is a violation. I think it would be a great good idea that the district asked Mr. Friedman to give a present to uh, have a presentation of what he presented during the ESRC meeting. And with Dan on board, that kit could be easily facilitated. That's it. But before I go, I would like to congratulate the district and board for choosing Dan as the new Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District or Urban Conservation Engineer. I've known Dan for almost 20 years. He's a great engineer, highly experienced, and highly respected by the industry and, and county staff. And Dan, I'm sure that you would enjoy the job working with a great team, the same way that I did during the last 20 years. And uh, by the way, Dan has been almost chairing ESRC during the last few years. And I believe with him being on board, he might be a good fit to represent uh, the district in ESRC because he knows everybody. He has a great knowledge of PFM and uh, he would be a great fit. Thank you. Thank you, Assad. And I'm sure working as close as you all are with each other, I'm sure working with Laura and the staff, they will get a chance to review those proposals. I would be glad to. Thank you. Laura, I think George might, is George on, George Lamb on the call with us? No, he's not, but he did submit a report um, okay. and an update on the activities of the Community Energy and Climate Action Plan. And I think uh, we got committee. That. Yes. You wanna talk a little bit about that? Laura? Uh, I honestly, I, I uh, have not had a to say to... Sorry? Uh, is there much to say beyond what he sent? 
No, I don't have anything in addition to what he sent. Okay, I hope most of the board members and maybe some others had a chance to look at what he did send. It came late last night, I think, if I remember right. John, this is John. Yeah. I'm yeah. afraid to unmute because I'm not sure I can get muted again. Um, I'm on the transportation side of that. You, you saw in his report that they divided the CCAP into two groups. I'm not yeah. representing the district. I'm, I'm an EQAC representative on, on that. And we have our meetings this week. So I expect they'll be more forthcoming in February. Okay, thank you, Jonna. Any, any, any other questions anybody has? If not, I think we're down to uh, other items for the directors, associates, and consultants. I would just like to mention one thing. Recently, uh, Scott Cameron got back in touch with me. Many of you know Scott. He was an elected board member with our district. And prior to that, he actually served for almost two years as an associate. Uh, and Scott is now back out of government, and he asked if he might be considered to be an associate again with our district because he'd like to help the district. So, uh, unless there's some objection to that i really would like to appoint scott as an associate member of our conservation district in the past his skills i seem to be in the area of budgeting and strategic planning do any of the board members have any concern with our nominating scott as an associate member Did we i'll make a motion uh, i've been moved by adria that we uh nominate scott or, or appoint scott as an associate member is there a second i'll I would, second i would second that too and i wonder did we ever Dump him as an associate director? I mean, resigned. <laughs> he resigned as a director. You're, I'm sorry. Right. So yeah, he, he, he ran for an election in 2015. So he was no longer an associate. He won for election and then went back into government and now is back out. Right, right. Yes, sir. Many of you know he was at the Department of Interior. And the other thing Scott uh, was, was really involved in that, that I think has some impact for us, he started an invasive species organization that he's still a leader in that's still going and going pretty strong. I forget the name of it, but at any rate, we do have a motion and a second that we approve Scott as an associate member. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, Director Corner? Aye. Director Bordas? Aye. Director Bilger? Aye. Director Peters? Aye. I will send a letter of appointment to Scott saying he is welcome back as an associate director. Scott was a big help. He was one of the associates that really helped us a lot, I think. Is there any other director that has something under uh, other items? Mr. Chairman, may I? As yes. As an associate director, I want to support the idea of having Scott join our group. He was a, a quite a, an effective member when he was here once before, and we look forward to having him join us again. Thank you, Harry. And he's from the Mount Vernon area where we don't have a lot of representation. Yeah, this is John. I just want to echo what Harry said. Well, thank you. Thank you. I will inform him. I'm sure he'll be happy. He really missed the district. I heard from him a lot, and I think he was kind of sorry he left. Uh, any other items, though, on the part of the directors, associates, or consultants? If not, we'll move on to the associate direct, uh, executive director's report. Thank you, John. Um, I wanted to make one quick note um, and it well, and just uh, share that uh, John OK uh, reached out to me just yesterday and acknowledged that um, he and Judy OK have served for a long time uh, members as consultants with with our district. They moved to Solomon's Island, Maryland um, many years ago. And so he is recommending that he would like to step away from being a consultant um, with the district. So um, honoring that request, I'm going to going to send him a, a letter um, or I would like to send him a letter from from the board uh, thanking him for his service and uh, consultations with the district over, gosh, Diane, how long has he been represented with the district? A couple of decades, maybe? Um, sure, yes, a long time. A long time, <laughs> a long time. Yes. Um, so while he may be stepping aside as a consultant, he will always remain a friend um, to the district for sure, both him and Judy. So, um, but he he has made that request to uh, to step step away. So. Um, if you all will allow me, I'll, I will be sure to send him a note of thanks and gratitude and express the gratitude on behalf of um, the whole organization. I think we will, Laura. Most of us know John and Judy both. 
Matter of fact, I worked with John for 25 years at USDA. Yes. So we will still be sure to include them in any celebrations and things like that that we may have. And again, as, as friends. Um, I also wanted to just thank Adria uh, for her patience as we were waiting for some information about her uh, reappointment and for taking the time to, to move forward and, and um, take your oath prior to the end of the last calendar year. Um, I think it's it's really great. We look forward to continuing to work with you and, and continuing to um, have your wonderful leadership as well. In additional news and celebration, um, in 2020, we actually celebrated two employees who had milestone anniversaries. Um, and usually during our Virginia Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts annual meeting, the Virginia Association of Conservation District employees um, usually distribute awards during their luncheon uh, to recognize the, those significant achievements. And so I really miss the opportunity to kind of hoot and holler for some of our colleagues and um, and especially hear the same from a number of our friends and counterpart uh, across the Commonwealth. But nonetheless, the Association of Conservation District employees um, actually sent us a couple of awards that I'd like to present today. And I'm sorry that our team members are not here in the office to receive them, but I'll, I'll leave them on your desks. Um, in celebration of Willie, who uh, uh, celebrated his 30 years with the district last January, um, the Association of Conservation District Employees provided this wonderful wall plaque um, for him to celebrate 30 years. So I think we need to all come off mute and hoot and holler. Hey. Hey. That is cool. Way to go. Congratulations, <laughs> Willie. <laughs> it really is a beautiful plaque and and Willie I know you're 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 very proud of it as as we're very proud of you. I also wanted to recognize that just as I have a space for it already. Oh, all right. All and right. I'm looking at it right I'm looking at the blank wall right now. <laughs> Been working towards it. <laughs> You've had your space there for 30 years. You've just 30 been long years. Waiting to fill it. <laughs> Thank um, you. Congratulations, Willie. I also wanted to recognize just as COVID was hitting, one of our, our, our team members also celebrated five years with the district. And Maria Harwood is in receipt of this beautiful wooden keychain to celebrate five years. I'm going to try to get it as close as possible so that you can see it. Um, so, and there's a nice little back with the association's logo. This is again the Association of Conservation District Employees. So let's give a moment. Come off right, here and hear the holler from Maria. Yes. Woo way to go, Maria. All right, Maria. Yeah. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Love the wood. That is so cool. They're very beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful. So congratulations to our team members. And again, thank you all for your, your great service. Um, I have a few other acknowledgements that I, I wanted to just make real quick, um, and then I'm hoping I can turn, uh, the, once I end, I can turn this over to Ashley to really share some great insights into the work that she's been doing on, the, on our outreach and education program. Certainly wanted to take a moment to welcome Don. This is Don's second day with us. He started yesterday. He's been drinking from the fire hose just like we normally do during orientations and trying to learn all the history of the district. Um, as well as getting into um, many of the activities that he, he is going to be doing. I also wanted to welcome back Meredith Keppel. Meredith joined us back in, in the fall as our outreach intern, and she's continuing with us this spring um, to be able to participate and, and do a lot of our social media work. I don't think she's with us this morning, um, but she returned yesterday, and it was certainly nice to have her energy back here in the office. I also wanted to just express a kudos to Judy Frazier, who's really jumping into her new role with both feet. She has assumed the chair position of the VCAP steering committee down with the State Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. And if you haven't taken a moment already to take a look at the staff report, I hope you'll take a look at hers in particular and see a map that she's created with the distribution of the VCAP site visit requests that came in in FY21. It's really a nice scattering of different sites. Good. She also is providing, yes, and she also provided some status of the um, FY20 approved project applications that we're, we're still waiting on in terms of completion and some new materials that have been developed 
um, for the uh, the steering committee as well. So just wanted to acknowledge again that she's jumping in with both feet. She's really integrating herself well. I appreciate all the time and commitment that our other team members have also uh, taken to really integrate her into the team and bring her up to speed on on the wide variety of programs um, that we offer as well. Um, I also Laura, may I inter may I interrupt a minute? I, sure, I wanted sure. to to remind people of the first time we ever saw or heard of uh, Miss Keppel. Uh, was a, a green breakfast event that she gave while she was in high school. I might point out about mushrooms and other kinds of fungus. It was fascinating. And it was even more fascinating when you consider the fact that she wasn't old enough to drive a car yet. And uh, uh, did a wonderful job. And and Nancy and I have been keeping track of Laura or of, uh, of uh, Meredith for a long time here now since she's been in school and college. And she's doing a wonderful job. And her addition to our staff is uh, a, a great move forward. She's really provided some meaningful, um, meaningful work, and she and Ashley are a wonderful team. So I, I, I ex echo those kudos, um, Harry. She really has been a fantastic addition, and, and we're excited that she's going to be with us again this spring. Um, I wanted to take a moment. I noticed that uh, uh, Maria included some information about the seedling sale in the chat. Um, Maria, do you want to take a few moments just to uh, give an update? Is she still here? Did I lose her? No, I think she left that in the chat because she had to leave. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I apologize that I, I um, didn't get to her before she left, but you'll notice that uh, the information that is in the chat, our seedling sale opens in just a week. Um, we're very excited about it. She has been working hard with a team of, of folks, including Heather and Ashley, Willie and Dan and Meredith uh, and Judy, the whole team. Honestly, this is always an all hands on deck kind of effort. Um, and I really appreciate the team oriented approach um, to the seedling sale and, and getting ready uh, for, for opening day on February 22nd, uh, excuse me, February 2nd. It's a week from uh, from today. Um, so we do anticipate that, that the seedlings are going to go pretty fast. Um, already we're hearing from folks that are, uh, I have heard just anecdotally, we're staying up until, you know, after midnight in order to be one of the first. Um, so we do anticipate a, a, a good sale this year. Um, just as in the past, any extra seedlings that we may have um, will be uh, going to some rest restoration projects um, in the area. A couple of there are some adjustments that we're making for COVID this year. We will not be selling extras this year so that we can keep the line moving and keep the process moving as well. Um, so it's it will look a little bit different. And some of those details in terms of how we're going to be conducting the bundling as well as the distribution are still also um, under discussion. Um, so stay tuned for more information. I am. Uh, positive that Maria will be providing updates either through her reports um, or uh, in person at future meetings. I wanted to take another moment to just note in Dan's report that he has been conducting regular meetings with our Green Sheets team and that they've been working together to develop some shared resources which are really coming together very, very nicely. We're going to be rolling out a new ArcGIS based tracking system in the next week um, that we can use and that will be integrated with a lot of other county information as well so that that can be used and useful information from a, a policy development perspective, which is also very, very exciting. So hopefully once we get our feet underneath us, maybe we can provide a demonstration to the board um, at a future meeting as well. Finally, I wanted to thank Heather for all of her efforts in processing our calendar year end financials and tax information and tax forms. Um, we are moving forward with the actuarial study as well with the Virginia retirement system and hope to have some of that information back here in, in the coming months. So we have been very, very productive, even just within this first start of the year. And I just wanted to, to thank all of our, our staff for their, for their efforts and onboarding new team members and um and gearing up for um this very exciting year 
There's a couple, one other thing before, I don't want to belabor on too much before we get to Ashley, but I wanted to highlight a couple of key personnel changes that are also happening at the county that you all might want to be aware of. Um, Ellie Cotting, who's been uh, a, a director, division director with um, Land Development Services, has assumed the de deputy director position with the Department of Public Works and Environmental Services that will lead the stormwater management and wastewater management divisions. Um, this is Randy Bartlett's previous position, and, and she's going to do fantastic there, and I'm, I'm glad to know that we've got a strong partner uh, in that position. Also, Matt Myers, who's been a branch chief uh, and was also one of our former cooperators of the year. Um, he's with the Department of Public Works and Environmental Services Stormwater Planning Division. He has recently assumed um, the director position for the Climate Adaptation and Resiliency Planning uh, uh, program uh, with the Office for Environmental and Energy Coordination. So, Chris, you'll be working with Matt on the development of the park. Uh, Denise That's James. Good. I know Matt, and I, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Uh, Denise James, uh, who's the branch chief with the uh, environmental policy programs with the Department of Planning and Development, is re actually retiring in the next couple of months. We've worked with her on uh, ag forestal districts. Um, as well as um, some of the zoning uh, 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 projects that relate to community gardens and some of the policies that have been developed through there. We work with her or with her group on that. So she'll be sorely missed. She was, a, she was another good partner. And as I understand it, the position was uh, her successor, that position um, was advertised um, earlier this month and, and just closed just a week ago. So we do anticipate that they'll be bringing on some uh, a new team member uh, to lead that that policy program group, and uh, we'll be sure to again continue to welcome them uh, and work with them accordingly. Finally, I wanted to mention that Kirk Kincannon, who's the executive director with the Fairfax County Park Authority, is also retiring this spring. His position has not been advertised, but he's been with the Park Authority for the last gosh four years, perhaps. He came and presented at a green breakfast to share some of his vision um, once he came on board. Um, and he's been also a good partner and a strong um, advocate and ambassador for the for our district and our district programs. So he'll also be sorely missed, but we look forward to welcoming his successor as well. So right, as um, with, note, Kirk has been with the Park Authority in two different occasions for a lot of years, more than just the four or five that he's been the director. He started off flipping hamburgers at uh, Akatink, like a whole lot of former directors. And uh, uh, his his uh, departure is going to be really felt. It's already felt. It so. is. It is. So a lot of change um, coming up. And I'm, I'm certain that I, I will likely be presenting additional changes in personnel um, over the coming months as, as folks are retiring as well. Um, so there are several others that I could also that are worth mentioning um, as well. Kristen Sinclair from the Fairfax County Park Authority um, moved on to work with the Federal Energy Reserve uh, Commission and doing some uh, environmental impact statement and environmental assessment review for them. Um, she will be that's also a loss. She was a great asset um, for Fairfax County. And then also Brendan Ford, who's with the GIS department, um, was a great partner. We had a number of wonderful ideas. He also retired back in December. I didn't even know he was eligible for retirement, but um, he did. He's now working with the uh, District of Columbia's uh, department, uh, Department of Public Works and, and doing GIS there as well. So a lot of changes, a lot of changes, but um, a lot of new opportunities and uh, opportunities for some new friends. So um, with that, John, that's my report for today. Uh, and I would really um, like to turn it over to Ashley uh, in order to share some of the work that she's been doing with the outreach and education programs over this last year. Welcome back, Ashley. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. I just have a, a couple of slides with pictures and things so I can show you a little bit. Here we are, I think everybody can see that. So this is gonna be kind of a condensed version of the report that's already in the um, 
that was sent out as part of the board package. And this really came out of, I wanted to take a look at this last year and see how the pandemic ended up affecting our education and outreach programs, because I still felt pretty busy, even though we were shut down for a little bit of time. And, and I wanted to see really how do the numbers stack up. And then the more I was looking at, the more I was fascinated by what I was finding that we have had a very productive um, year with our programs. We've reached a lot of people. We've made a lot of difference. And then I just really wanted to have the opportunity to share that with everyone. So this is just a couple of slides that I just wanted to share some of the things that we have accomplished this year and kind of how they stack up to past years. So firstly, a huge thank you to all of the interns that supported the outreach education team this year or in 2020. Without them, really, we would not have had the reach that we currently have. Um, Carolyn Doherty joined us for winter 2019, 2020. Just a couple of weeks um, we got her, but she was able to help us with the seedling sale prep, um, something we're calling green trivia, which is, you know, work in progress and several other things that really just helped to kind of shape up the programs for the year and set them up for success. Tessa Bennett um, was our intern for the spring of 2020. Now Tessa Shelton, she was married over the summer. Um, and she helped us with our educational videos and posts. And really when that pandemic first hit and we shut everything down in March, she was incredibly helpful in turning everything around to create more engaging videos for social media and engage people digitally um, rather than those in-person programs we couldn't have anymore. And she was also pivotal to putting up the sustainable garden tour in 2020, which was a, a feat that we're very proud of. And then Meredith, who's already been mentioned and is joining us again, was really helpful this fall in expanding um, some more of our video and social media programming and outreach and making it look a little bit more professional, giving the district a look so that um, our videos are recognizable and of very high quality. Um, she led a storm drain relabeling effort to see um, how long the drain labels are lasting. Um, which I'll talk a little bit about later as well, but she led that effort and she's also led a stream monitoring effort. She herself became a certified stream monitor this fall. And so this spring, she'll be taking a larger role in leading some of our public workshops. As always in 2020, we participated in several um, state association initiatives. We participated in the training blitz um, we were the representative from area two for the education session. And there I shared the sustainable garden tour and stream monitoring and some of the other things we had done safely to still engage our community. So we were part of that program. We were part of the scout patch program, which this year allowed scouts to reach out to a conservation district representative, in most cases myself and ask them questions about soil and water, and then they could get a patch for their vest. So we participated in that. We had, I don't have this specific number, we have 21 entries to the conservation poster contest. That's definitely down from last year when we had over 100 different entries, but it's still a really spectacular number seeing as most of the students who submit do it in class and then send it in. So since we didn't have any classes, these were all individual students. So it was a fantastic turnout. And this picture here, we need bees because we need fruits and vegetables. That is actually the poster of our winner um, from the kindergarten to first grade category, Natalie Peters. And she actually won um, at the state level as well. So we were really proud of her poster. We did participate in YCLI again this year, and since that goes with the school year, we've got technically two seasons of YCLI in 2020. And we've talked about this before at a green breakfast and I think during other board meetings, so I won't go too far into it. But it gives high schoolers the opportunity to do community service and work with a professional mentor to create lasting environmental change. So we've had studies on water quality. We've had um, educational programs be developed. We've had all kinds of things done um, from these amazing kids. So we participated that and wrapped it up in the spring. And then we started a new one in the fall and I'm working with another cohort of kids now. How many, Ashley? How many? Well, actually, our district has six kids this year, which is a lot. Um, 
we are mentoring two and a half of them here at, at our office um, and others have mentors throughout the county but yeah six kids in Fairfax County which is a lot that is a lot um, youth conservation camp unfortunately was canceled um, between the start of the pandemic and when the camp would start there just wasn't enough time to really make that virtual um, it does look like it's coming back for 2021 and then um, for our scholarship our winner is over here in the upper right. This is Wendy Gao. She won our local scholarship and she was awarded $1,000 to help pay for her college expenses from the district. And then we sent her up to the state association for the next level of judging. And she was also one of the four winners chosen there. So now she's going to have a total of $2,000 to put towards her education. And we've worked with her on a number of other projects. She's very active within her community. So we're really excited to see what she's going to do next. We also had some programs that we'd put together sort of specifically to address the COVID situation where we needed to be able to reach our community in a very different sort of way. So first we started out with some webinars and we had a lot of guest speakers for those. Willie led one on backyard chicken management. Dan did one on soils and Maria did one on rain gardens. I did one on bees and we covered all these different topics. Um, and I think that that kind of pivot very early in the pandemic helped to still encourage some people to engage with us. And then after that, we didn't have to be quite so um, active as with those webinars, which is very similar to putting on the green breakfast now and it's it's quite a lot to ask of our staff um, so we were able to kind of spontaneously pop in some educational videos instead that's where the interns have really helped out with creating content i know in the spring tessa had created a lot of videos engaged towards kids and the idea being um, you can create a seed ball at home you can create a soilarium at home and see how um, soil can break things down this is how you can compost at home so a lot of those quick videos that are still um, very good for recurring content. And then these are some of the graphics that we've used in some of our social media. So for World Wanted Brewing Day and uh, Where Does Your Snowman Go? We've just got content going out all the time about some things that are timely, um, like World Wanted Day. And then other things, like we just want to tell people about watersheds. So we're using the season to do it. The snowman went out with a post where we talked about um, the watershed mapper that Fairfax County has. So you can find your own watershed and where your water goes. And then this cute little snowman was just our way of getting them there. Um, and then we also have um, some videos that have went out. You may have seen them on our Facebook page or on our YouTube page. Dan has really great content about soil science. And then we'd also put together some of those videos that we talked about that are going to be part of the Eco Savvy Symposium, like this one here on the bottom left about um, coir logs um, or the biologs. The Sustainable Garden Tour was a huge accomplishment this year. Uh, we had originally partnered with the uh, Fairfax Food Council's Urban Agriculture Working Group to focus on front yard gardens and edible landscapes. And we had a really great plan. And then of course that got shut down. And so instead we had to move it virtual. This is sometimes challenging for our site hosts because they didn't really have the content or they didn't really know how to film a video. And so we had to have um, some of our staff go out and take videos with them and do recording. We had to edit some of the videos for them and we put them up on YouTube. And because we had such a variety of different hosts, we had a variety of different kinds of content. So we had slideshows, we did some live webinars, like uh, Adria actually was um, our live webinar where we got to see all the great stuff growing in her garden. And then we did YouTube videos as well. And so we have all those still on our website. This is, I'm hoping, going to be a permanent resource that we'll have, and it'll just be updated kind of throughout the years as we change things up. This year, we're also planning on doing a virtual sustainable garden tour for everyone's safety. And our reach there was really incredible. With the posts that we made on Facebook alone, just about the sustainable garden tour, we reached over 13,000 people, which is an incredible reach. Um, particularly when you think about the traditional garden tour, which normally might have two or 300 people attending. And although those 13,000 people probably didn't go to every site, we did still have some engagement with them. 
And then on the YouTube videos that we had, we had 5,800 views of those different YouTube videos. And that actually equates to more than 45,000 minutes of viewing sustainable garden tour content. So we don't have a way of reaching out to the individual people who did watch the videos, but we can definitely make some good conclusions there that the people are learning something from this. Otherwise they wouldn't watch the whole video or they wouldn't go to all the sites and they wouldn't watch all the tours. So we're definitely making an impact. Um, and again, this is all online and in 2021, we hope to do something similar. Our storm drain education program was active throughout uh, the pandemic. We kind of shut it down in about March and April and a little bit of May. But this was actually a really great activity for people to do when they were socially distancing um, because you could just pick up supplies from the office for me and we would have it, you know, I'd do a no contact drop off and everybody could pick up supplies and then bring it back when they were done. They could work in smaller groups. And so that was a very, very active program. Uh, we did do a label longevity study. We've wondered for a while how long the labels actually last from the manufacturer. They're expected to last about 10 years, but the manufacturers of Florida, we haven't really done a test up here. And so it's hard to know how many of the labels we say that we've placed are actually still there. So we started doing a study this year to take a look at that. And it seems like about 60 to 70% of labels need to be replaced after about 10 years. So that helps us to kind of look at going back and relabeling different communities, finding uh, the HOAs that are reaching out and seeing if they're ready to relabel, things like that. So we can be a little bit more proactive with our labeling. In 2020, we had 237 volunteers who donated a total of 427.9 volunteer hours. Um, that equates to an in-kind donation of over $12,000 worth of volunteer time. We labeled uh, 1,203 storm drains and educated approximately 4,000 households about um, non-point source pollution and how to prevent that from entering your storm drains. What's particularly interesting about this data is that in the spring, we only had two projects. And normally the spring is, is very, very busy. That first half of the year is very, very busy because it's springtime and everybody's active and it's Earth Day, so people want to do things for the environment. But we only had two projects in that time, which means that the other 18 projects that contributed to the program this year were all after July. So they were all pandemic projects. So it's really fantastic that our community was so engaged. And lastly, but certainly not least, stream monitoring was also very active this year. And getting stream monitoring to be an active program again was very interesting and also quite a challenge for our education and outreach team, but very worthwhile. So we stopped doing stream monitoring in March. We had two workshops on the March 13th, March 14th, March 15th, everybody went home. So. That was really the end of it. And then we started up again in August. So in that break in between, we took a lot of time to develop the COVID precautions that we were going to have for our program. We used some guidance from Virginia Save Our Streams to inform what we wanted our precautions to look like. And then we established a very comprehensive document that explains how we're gonna clean all of our materials, how many people are allowed, where the people will be and things like that. And that has actually been so successful that um, it's been shared again with Virginia Save Our Streams and sent throughout the state. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we're the only um, volunteer based workshops that are being held for stream monitoring um, as of even today. Um, it's really difficult to get all your volunteers together safely. So I'm really appreciative that um, Tessa and Meredith who helped me Pull that together we're able to help out the water Actually, was that break all virus related it was yeah we normally would have one or two workshops a month and so those several months we had off we were developing the new way that we were going to do stream monitoring um, the new way we do stream monitoring everyone is much more socially distanced all the materials are sanitized before and after use 
and we are limiting our attendance. So when we look at how many people attended our workshops, we recognize that that we would normally have a lot larger workshops. Normally we'd have about 20 plus people at a workshop and then our new systems having us at about eight to 10. The watershed calendar newsletter does go out every month and that is how we share our um, stream monitoring workshops and other things like that that are going on throughout the county. It's also been the way that we share a lot of our district events that for people who are not on a specific mailing list, it's kind of like our catch all. Uh, that's had a readership of over 1900 people um, throughout the year and has gone out every month. We did participate in one soft bottom monitoring, which is pictured here. All of our other monitorings are with rocky bottom streams. Um, and this is with the friends of Dyke Marsh trying to take a look at the health of a little tiny stream that leads into Dyke Marsh. Um, the health of that stream wasn't looking so great this year, but I think that that's more because we monitored it in summer and it had largely dried up because it had been on an upward health trend, which was really great to see. This year we had a total of 27 active sites. Six of those are monitored by the district and I have um, some information on those on the next slide. Those district sites are the ones that we hold the public workshops at. So the other 21 sites are all sites that are active and um, monitored by our 25 active certified monitors. Most of them volunteered to still continue their sites this year. There were a couple who didn't have someone who could go with them from their house, so they didn't feel safe monitoring. So they did pause their sites, but we did have 25 of them active this year. All of our sites are actually pictured in the little map here, and the ones that are named CR13, CR5, those are all the district sites. And then every other star represents one that is from our regional team. We actually had a certification workshop this year, which was incredible, particularly because we did have such limited engagement. Um, and there were also a lot of volunteers from our region, Prince William, Loudoun, Arlington, um, that didn't have an active stream monitoring program. So they came to get certified with us. So we performed a really valuable service, not only for our volunteers, but also for the volunteers of the greater Virginia Save Our Streams community. This year, we had a total of 11 community workshops and had a total of 111 workshop volunteers. And with those um, volunteers, oh, I didn't get the numbers on that. There we go. With their donation of time for the volunteers that we had here and also our certified monitors, they volunteered more than 592 hours of volunteer labor, which was equated to almost $17,000 in our lease donation. And lastly, this is just some area from the sites that we monitor consistently. So I've got some data going back to 2015. We monitor in both spring and fall. These are our six sites. And then we did our monitoring in both spring and fall. Unfortunately, in fall, we weren't able to go to all of our sites. Um, we just didn't have the chance to get out. Um, or if we did go to the site, then uh, we had a group that we weren't able to submit the data for some reason. Um, but generally, the green squares are, are good, healthy streams. Red squares are unhealthy streams. The gray eights are those we need to take a little bit of a closer look at. Um, so as you can see, the streams in Fairfax County that we monitor do not have a history of being the most healthy streams. And for that reason, and because they are urban streams, it is so important to get our volunteers out there to, to take a look at these streams and to learn more about water quality. So that is the end of my presentation there. I know I've said quite a bit. Actually, it seems like my sound is going in and out. So if you couldn't hear that, I apologize. But we did a lot this year as a district. We accomplished so much. And although it's not as much as it has been in past years, it's absolutely astounding considering that we were in the middle of a global pandemic almost all year. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Ashley. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask Ashley? No, but I just want to say uh, thank you, Ashley, for giving that review. You know, we don't see it meeting much, so I'm glad to have you to bring this information to us. Good work. Laura, anything else from the executive directors? 
I, I just wanted to, to thank Ashley and the interns and all of our team members for really stepping up this year as well. It was, it was an impressive amount of, of work that was done to really pivot. And I think we've learned a lot of great lessons um, through this, really over the last eight months or so, as we've been really um, moving a lot of our programs to a virtual setting. And it's something that Ashley and I have talked about of, of how do we continue that in the future because we have a much broader reach um, by being able to offer these programs virtually. Not only that, do we broaden our reach, but then we also create resources that are readily available at any time for folks to be able to participate. So some really great things. Um, and I really look forward to uh, continuing to hear uh, Ashley's innovations with her programs um, and the work that she does to engage all of the team members and in, in coming up with new ideas and new materials as well. So um, kudos, Ashley, and kudos to the rest of the team. You guys are really doing a fantastic job. They are, and it's much appreciated. I think we're now down to cooperating agencies. Did I hear somebody? Well, I just I just wanted to make a note, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, you know, being in the outreach world and working with lots of different advocacy groups and, and I just have to really applaud all of you, the staff, Laura, you guys have done remarkably in this COVID time and in this COVID era and moving what is actually an outdoors world indoors and bringing it virtually to people and growing um, knowledge of what this is. So I really, I think I've been very impressed. I'm excited about what the future holds because this has been an opportunity in many ways to expand access for um, people. And so just really applauding it. I've seen a lot of bad impacts from people who have tried to do some of this stuff and I've seen great work and this is really on the level of great work. So congratulations to everyone. It's really, it's been impressive and, and I think this is really turned into an opportunity for soil and water conservation districts. So that's all I wanted to say. I think we all agree. Thank you, Monica. We're down now to cooperating agencies and I don't believe we have anybody from the Department of Public Works, do we? Do we have anybody from the Public Health Department? If not, Debbie, how about DCR? Is she still with us? Uh, John, yes. she's in a chat. Yeah, I'm still? here. Okay. No, I'm here. I'm here. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, hope everybody's having a good new year. Um, a few things to share with you this morning. First of all, um, Ashley, that was an awesome report. <laughs> I can't believe in these day and times that y'all were able to accomplish as much as you could in the education field. Great job. And I certainly want to congratulate Willie on his 30 years of service. Willie, it seems like yesterday, <laughs> you and I are old dogs now. <laughs> um, a couple of things from my report, just to bring to your attention, um, the IRS mileage rate changed the 1st of January, so we're all aware of that. Um, the governor's budget, um, this is important. The General Assembly went into session earlier in the month. It's gonna be a short session, um, as y'all are probably quite aware, very few bills will be able to be introduced by each senator and legislator. They're hoping to have a 30-day session. That's what the General Assembly wants. Um, I understand the governor wants it to extend to 45, but um, I, yeah. anyway, as far as our work goes, the governor's budget that he proposed on December the 16th um, proposes $35 million for our agriculture cost share program, which is um, level funding for what it is in the current year. Um, technical assistance is level funding. Um, he's um, introduced $500,000 for VCAP. If you'll recall, fiscal year 22 didn't have anything for cost share, anything for VCAP, so that's good. Um, so we're very optimistic um, in times when um, things could be really, really bad. Um, it's great that the governor's office had those items in his budget proposal um, because it's much harder to get things introduced, especially in a year like this year. So, so, so we're feeling pretty comfortable. Um, we'll just have to wait and see what happens when they get into deliberations of the second year of the biennium budget. So that's where we are with that. Um, I hope everybody's had an opportunity to participate in some of the training that was offered through the virtual blitz of the association. Ashley mentioned that earlier, but there was a slew of training that was offered. Um, those that I, um, I couldn't participate in all of them, but the ones that I did participate in, I thought they were well done. I think it showed that we are capable of 
um, providing and receiving training in this virtual format. Um, some of them are quite, quite good, um, but I hope that the directors had an opportunity to participate in those. There's a couple more still going on. There's going to be one on cover crops in February and then one on nutrient management and precision ag training in, in March, more technical types of training. Um, but I think the association is about at the end of what we considered the virtual blitz. Um, and I do hope that you were able to participate in those. Um, DCR is continuing, I should say, the Division of Soil and Water Conservation, which is the division that I work with. Um, is having all of their staff work from home now. Um, before it was um, it was a choice. Now it's required that we telework, um, and that's through at least the end of January. But my my gut is that we will be doing this probably for at least another month until either vaccinations are um, possible for the general public, because um, most of us will fall under the general public, um, or. Um, you know, the, the governor releases um, the executive order that he put in place December the 10th. So um, if you need to reach me, that's the moral of the story. Call me on my cell phone or email me. Those are the best ways to reach me. Um, I do go because I'm only 12 miles from the office. Um, I'm able to go in and do big printing jobs like the board meeting packet. I ran in there yesterday to print your board meeting packet and Thomas Jefferson's board meeting packet. Um, so I can go in to print, um, but that's about the only thing. Um, I did want to remind you that when the Finance Committee gets back together to make sure you review the desktop procedure for fiscal operations, that's one of the deliverables that needs to be met during the fiscal year. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to just remind you or tell you about, you might hear about it, Adrian, I know you're aware of it, and that is that there is a voluntary BMP survey that is ongoing in Virginia through March um, to agriculture producers to try to get a handle on um, the kinds of and the number of voluntary BMPs that farmers have on their land. Um, and this survey is being sent out by many of the agricultural communities. Um, and we're hoping, Virginia Tech is the lead on it. Um, and extension agents are certainly helping us with this. Um, but we're hoping that we can get um, very reliable, information that we can use in the Bay model of voluntary BMPs that farmers have installed. It's something we've been you know, wanting to do for a very long time to get a handle on that because we know lots of producers are installing practices that could be counted, but if they don't go through our cost share program or NRCS's cost share program, it's very hard for us to capture that because they're put in voluntarily. So we're very excited about what the results of this survey will be, but you may hear about it among your peers. You may, you may hear people, um, people may even call the district and ask questions, um, but that's going on. The Soil and Water Board plans to meet in March, April, and May. Those dates haven't been set, but they'll begin their deliberations on all of the things that they deliberate on in the spring, including our cost share program for fiscal year 22, um, the grant agreements for soil and water districts, and the policies for soil and water districts. Um, Debbie? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just wanted to make a quick note. Next month, um, the Lake Barcroft Watershed Improvement District will be uh, coming to our board to present their annual budget for FY22. So I just wanted to put it on your radar that we'll likely try to get the information ready for the March um, Soil and Water Board meeting. Okay, I'll, I'll let Blair know so that she can let others know. And it will be, if we don't get it in March, we can always get it in April. This is a good time of year with the Soil and Water Board because they have three meetings in a row. So if you miss one, but other times of the year, it's tough if you miss that date. <laughs> and no, that's all. Totally, <laughs> totally understand. And I'll, and I'll work through the appropriate channels with Michael um, and, and Fletcher yeah. and yourself. So. That's, that's all I have unless folks have questions. Happy to be here. Thank you, Debbie. Any questions for Debbie? If not, uh, is Peggy McBee Shaw on from NRCS? She was on at least at the start, I thought Laura said, and then dropped off. All right, Jim, Dr. Mc Jim McGlone from the Department of Forestry. If you're still with us. I'm still here, John. Um, I don't have a whole lot today. Um, I just wanted to let uh, you know that the Virginia Trees for Clean Water Grants uh, have been opened and are due February 16th. So if you do have any tree planting programs uh, or uh, projects and you want to get um, you want to get uh, cost share for for that, 
you can apply for that. And let me know. I've got the forms that you need to fill out for it. Also, I learned this morning that uh, yesterday, the Augusta Nursery started lifting hardwood seedlings for the seedling sale and other purchasers. Um, and I will be doing a, a presentation and Ask the Experts program next Monday on tree planting and selection. And I will be pushing the seedling sale again. I've been telling people to treat these the seedling sale like Jimmy Buffett tickets and be ready at midnight, place their orders or they're not gonna get them. I'm gonna take that as a great compliment. I mean, that's, that's a lot of fun for sure. Thank you, Jim, is that it? That's it. All right, is there any other business to come before the board? Yes. John, I just did want to note, and I apologize, I may have just interrupted, but Peg, um, uh, Sean McBee did actually uh, put a note in the chat stating that she um, has been on, she's been able to see us and hear us, but she's been teleworking from home, so her, her Wi-Fi or her uh, connection has been breaking up a little bit. Um, but uh, she says she enjoyed the meeting and putting some faces with the name, so thank you, she is signing off. But I'm glad that she was able to join us. Thanks, Peg. Yeah, we appreciate that. I don't think most of us have met her yet, and we'll get a chance to do that soon, we hope. If there's no other business to come before the board, is there a motion that the board meeting be adjourned? I, I, John, I have one last comment from, yes. um, from Laura and maybe Dan. In the past years, we did the, the composters, um, and I, I think I remember that there was some competition who could make things faster. Um, I have three chop saws and quite a bit of, of wood stuff around. So if there are enough um, barrels left, and I know there was a problem with the supplier, um, I don't think we should be limited in selling them and getting a little more revenue um, by the ability to make them. So I'd be willing to host or you know do some work to help make the parts. I appreciate that, Chris. Um, Thank you, Chris. Yeah, and I just want to say uh, um, Taylor Beach is also back um, from her her little reprieve during the, the winter months, um, and she is working with, she's got a whole big group of volunteers. We're not going to do the build-a-thon this year. Hi, Nora. Um, we're not going to do the build-a-thon this year uh, for, for COVID reasons, but um, I'll certainly let her know that you're you're willing to um, to help out with, with making some rain barrels. And Dan, I'll turn it over to you for uh, any discussion about uh, compost. So, sorry, I got my little helper here. Um, I think basically with the composters, we're just limited by the number of barrels that we have. So we're looking to do 15, which is the same amount that we had last year. Um, and possibly if we can find some more or I'll, I'll have to talk to Taylor to see what she can make available to us. But the plan right now is, is to do 15. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Chris. Anything else to come before the board? Yeah, that's really grown. <laughs> if not, is there a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion. It's been moved. We adjourn the meeting of the board. Is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll just ask all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Thank you all for your participation. A good meeting, and I think we accomplished a lot. Thank you, Laura and staff. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see everybody this morning. Bye. Right.